batteries in this uh, clicker. I forgot to do it between the services. While I'm changing the batteries, why don't you turn to the person beside you and tell them who do you think is the fastest uh, runner, runner, the fastest person on earth? Off you go. Liam, have I got service slides? Thank you. <laughs> Fastest man in history. It could be a, it could be a lady, but it's not. Fastest man in history is Jamaican sprinter Usain Bolt, uh, 2009. Uh, Usain Bolt set the world record for the 100 meter sprint uh, with a time of 9.58 seconds. Somebody this morning thought that there was a, a runner that was faster than that. I, I suspect there might have been a bloke who was on the juice who was faster, but they were disqualified. Um, uh, 100 meter sprint, 9.58 seconds. He also holds the 200 meter world record with a time of 19.19 seconds. Mitch is only a little bit slower than that. Uh, and me, I'm zero to 60 in about four minutes. Uh, the second fastest man in history, do you know who that is? Sorry? Good, good, good thoughts. Arguably, I'm going to say it is this bloke here, Johan Blake, who is or was uh, Usain Bolt's training partner. Uh, and as countrymen together, um, they pushed each other in their, uh, in their training and in their racing. So Blake holds the fastest, uh, the second fastest ever time for the 200 metres. Um, and he also ties for the second fastest 100 metres in history. So 100 and 200, these guys are one and two on both of them. And it seems that their intense rivalry pushed them uh, both to greater heights. So coming into the 2012 Olympics here, Blake had beaten Bolt um, in the Olympic trials in both the 100 and the 200 metres. And so the stage was set at the Olympics for a big showdown. And ultimately in the Olympic final, uh, Bolt and Blake finished first and second respectively in the 100 and the 200 metres. Um, but yo... Uh, Usain Bolt said this about his training partner, Johan Blake. He said, over the years, Johan has made me a better athlete. He's really pushed me and kept me on my toes. Um, as we open the Bible this morning, we're going to think about how we can push one another, how we can keep one another on our toes as Christians, because our passage today is all about how we can spur one another on to love and good deeds, as it says in Hebrews 24. Um, that's our theme for today, spurring one another on. So why don't we pray and then we'll open the Bible and see what it has to say about this topic. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the chance to meet together today. Even, um, even those uh, who are meeting and, and watching online, we pray that you would speak to us today through your word, that you would encourage us, that you would spur us on, and that you would teach us how to encourage one another. And we pray that you would use this time now to grow us as your church, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're in the third week now of our um, sort of beginner Kickstarter series for the year, Draw Near. Uh, it's all a, a series all about getting our focus right as the year begins, uh, beginning a year where we make deliberate choices to draw near to God in 2024. And uh, as Ian said, we've been reading the same passage every week, Hebrews 10, 19 to 25, and taking our instructions from that. Um, but I don't know if you've noticed something over the last couple of weeks. Um, a lot of what we've talked about, a lot of what I've talked about, is our personal response to the gospel. How will I draw near to God this year? But um, the writer to the Hebrews is, um, he's not just concerned about us as individuals, he's actually concerned about us together, uh, God's people together as the church. These instructions for, uh, for God's people to work out together uh, and to put at the center of our church life and our fellowship together. So uh, as I read the passage again, I want you to notice the repeated pattern that the author uses with the phrase, let us. Have a look, see if you can see it there. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider 
how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. So the uh, writer to the Hebrews, he wants us, the church, to think about how we can encourage one another in the faith. Um, So let me pop this one up. So let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Uh, This is not a new idea in the New Testament. Um, The New Testament is actually full of one another statements, all about how we should treat one another. Um, They all point to the ways that Christians should live out our faith together because Christianity is not primarily uh, an individualistic faith. Uh, It's not just about you and God, your private relationship with Him, just between you and Him. Uh, Our faith in Jesus is something that changes who we are and actually changes the way that we live with those around us, the way that we live in the world. Uh, God transforms us and renews us by the power of the Holy Spirit to make us more like His Son, Jesus. Because becoming a Christian means becoming part of a family. Uh, God adopts us as sons and daughters. Uh, We're placed in a family of God's people. Um, That's what the church is, a a little family of God where we belong to one another. Uh, We actually choose to belong to one another. We choose to relate to one another. We look after one another. We love one another here in the church. Um, John Wesley said, the Bible knows nothing of solitary religion. The Bible knows nothing of solitary religion. Another commentator said, uh, selfish Christianity is a contradiction in terms. As in, Christianity is just about me and God. Contradiction in terms. See, as Christians, we're made to live lives uh, with one another and even for one another. Uh, We're one another people. And that's because our God is a one another God. Um, The Trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're in eternal relationship with one another. And God has made us in his image. Um, That is, we're made for relationships, just like God is made in relationship. Uh, I preached a sermon on that last year. By the way, God is not made. Um, That just slipped out. Uh, But God is in eternal relationship. I preached a sermon on that last year in the Genesis series. Uh, But big idea number one is this. The exhortation right here in Hebrews 10.24, it's for all of us. Uh, Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not just my job, it's our job together. And God wants us to hear this as a church. He wants us to hear this encouragement and in fact this command as something that's important for us as a fellowship. If we all do it, it makes it easier for the rest of us. Now the picture here is deliberate. A few years ago, I was part of a cycling group. Um, Started with friends from church, uh, but it ended up uh, being with uh, all sorts of people from different backgrounds, and it made for really interesting conversations. We rode um, on Wednesday mornings and Friday mornings at 5.20 a.m., and that meant um, uh, it was dark, 51 weeks a year. Um, The week before Christmas was the only one when there was just a hint of sun as the start. Uh, In the dead of winter, it meant uh, riding in freezing conditions. Uh, For my Canadian and North American friends here, you're like that's like six months of the year um here it was almost freezing sometimes um but there's something about not letting the team go uh, not about letting sorry there's something about not letting the team down uh, when my alarm would go off at five o'clock the temptation's always just to pull up the covers and say no not today but um i knew that at that time there was an, a, another bunch of men who were also considering whether they would hit snooze and let the team down as well But every time I got to that meeting place, there were always uh, other men there who'd chosen to put on the team kit. Uh, They'd chosen to turn up. Um, And this group of men, it turned out to be one of the great encouragements of my life. Uh, Not just because we did um, some pretty incredible physical things together, uh, but they actually helped push me in my faith in the way that we discuss things as we rode shoulder to shoulder. Um, there are times when somebody's feeling strong and they ride at the front of the group and everybody kind of pulls behind. And then there's other times when you feel like you're the strong one and you can ride at the front. You take turns. You bear one another's burdens. A great metaphor for the Christian life. And that together we achieved things that few of us could have achieved on our own um, I didn't say this at the early service. I think my crowning achievement was riding up Macquarie Pass. Um, and we'd, we'd started in, well, Miranda. So it was a long ride before we got to Macquarie Pass. But there you go. Um, when we spur one another on, we can do all sorts of things that we never thought imaginable. And so as a church, let us consider how we may spur one another on to love and good deeds. 
Um, love, that's the first thing. Spur one another on towards love. What does love look like for one another in the church? Well, to answer that question, I want to take us to Colossians chapter 3, where we find a list of ways that we can love one another, a list of loving qualities that any church would aspire to. And we'll get to that list in a minute. Uh, because the list by itself is not enough. We, we, we don't just do lots of things. Um, what we really need is deep personal transformation, uh, the kind of transformation where God takes your life and he radically transforms you by the power of his Holy Spirit from the person who you were without Christ into the person that you become when your life is hidden in Christ. Um, uh, we put off our old self and we put on a new self, which is being renewed or made new in the image of the Creator, Colossians 3, 9 to 10. So love comes from not just our own effort, but actually being transformed internally by the Holy Spirit and being remade into the kind of people that God has made us to be. Uh, and if that's what's happening on the inside, of course we think that will be visible on the outside. That transformation will be obvious to others. So what does love look like in practice? Well, Firstly, it means that we don't look at the differences between ourselves. We look at our status in Christ. So have a look at this in Colossians 3, 11. It says here, here in the church, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. At this church in Colossae, where Paul was writing to, had people from all kinds of backgrounds. There were uh, Jews who'd become Christians. They put their faith in Jesus. And there were all kinds of non-Jews. That's what the word Gentile means. Um, and, you know, traditionally, Jews had separated themselves from all of the other races. Uh, but now Paul is telling them, don't make any divide, no separation between you and those who follow Jesus. There should be no religious divide between them. Then he says there should be no socioeconomic divides between them. That is, don't look at some people and say, you're a slave and, and treat them as the way that society treated slaves, uh, treating them as uh, people with lower honour than those who were born free. Uh, even the barbarians and Scythians, Scythians apparently were um, uh, nomadic people from the Baltic known for their savagery. Same as the barbarians, they're from sort of Germany, I believe. But even these people who were previously considered savages were now to be considered family because of the unity that we have in Christ. Uh, for us here in the Southern Highlands, um, the same command applies. Loving one another like Christ um, in the church means that we won't actually judge one another by race, won't judge one another by ethnicity, uh, we won't judge one another by our status in society, by our wealth or our poverty, we won't judge one another on our ability or our disability. We won't treat some people as better and some people as lesser based on the world's judgments. Instead, we'll allow the love of Christ to transform the way that we see one another. We'll start to see one another as family, brothers and sisters in Christ. Wouldn't that be amazing? Everybody to walk in the door and feel like they're family, like they belonged. Um, imagine that on a Sunday or at youth group on Friday. Imagine that in our after-school kids programs, in our small groups, our Bible studies. Because God willing... I know there's a few spare chairs today, but God willing, in the next couple of years, all the chairs will be filled. That we need to either get more chairs or run more services, as lots and lots of people are transformed by the love of Christ here in the Southern Highlands. I mean, I'd love to see youth busting at the seams. I'd love to see us needing to add rooms for kids. I'd love to see us having programs for all kinds of people. Wouldn't that be amazing? And you know what? When they all come, they... Let's say we instead. We won't all be the same. We won't all look the same. We won't all be the same age. We won't all have the same job status or anything that. We'll be made up of people from every tribe and nation and tongue because that's a picture of the church gathered around Jesus on the day, on the last day. No longer different tribes, but instead the chosen people of God together. Um, and as God's chosen people, which is what we are now, holy and dearly loved by God, we're to clothe ourselves with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. So imagine that. The love of Christ transforms how we see one another. The love of Christ transforms how we treat one another as well. And so we'll clothe ourselves in a transformed attitude, putting on the new self as Paul described it back in verse 10. 
Um, at our house, we love watching movies about American football. Um, they're all the same movie, basically. Um, it's, <laughs> you've seen them, haven't you? It's every sports movie, basically. Um, you know, you get a second string quarterback who's thrust into the limelight, or you get this overlooked player who works hard to become a champion, or there's a player who perseveres through adversity until they're finally picked. Um, that's invariably the plot line. But there's always a moment when that player is allowed to dress for the team for the first time. And the uniform goes on, and now they belong to something bigger than themselves. They're part of the team, and everybody is counting on them. And you know what? Paul says we have been chosen to dress for the biggest team that there is. We've been invited into God's chosen people. We've been made holy for a life of service to Him. We're dearly beloved by Him. And we're to put on an attitude that fits with who we are in Christ and who we're becoming. Those attitudes of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Every, every one of these attitudes is how we treat other people. So compassion is about feeling it when other people are hurting. The Bible describes it as rejoicing with those who rejoice and mourning with those who mourn. That's what Ross and Hannah just said was one of the best parts about being in a small group. When we love somebody deeply, it hurts us to see them hurting. That's compassion. Then there's kindness. Uh, it's being considerate of others, being friendly and generous and, and merciful, choosing love rather than indifference, choosing love rather than judgment, because that's the way that God's treated us, isn't it? God has treated us with loving kindness despite our many failings. And we're to clothe ourselves with humility, just like Jesus with gentleness, with patience. Uh, in fact, all of these attributes could describe Jesus, couldn't they? Because Jesus sa- shares the same character as his Father, and by the Holy Spirit, he's sharing his character with us. He's encouraging us to put on those characteristics more and more, even as he works on us from the inside. Uh, the passage reminds us that alongside the internal transformation, um, we can make the choice to transform the outside. We can kind of put these things on. Some days you have to put it on, don't you? But that's good to keep doing it. Um, says this, bear with one another and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Uh, church is a family. And you know, relationships in families can be difficult sometimes. Um, Well, it's the same at church. In the church family, there's nothing new about this. Uh, The early church where Paul was writing to, this church was probably only 10 years old. And already they'd felt what happens as people make mistakes, as people sin against one another, as hurts build up. Because even though we're being transformed into the likeness of Christ, it's so easy to revert to the old ways, isn't it? To the old self to the old sins, to the old behaviours. And brothers and sisters, even in church, we sin against one another. It just happens. Hopefully not intentionally, but it does happen. You know, it's just a fact of being uh, unfinished people, as one commentator called us. Unfinished people in a broken world, still in need of God's grace and transforming forgiveness. Isn't that true? We're unfinished people. One day we'll be finished, but for the moment, God's working on us. He's working in us. And the church presents an excellent opportunity to work on our godliness as we bear with one another, as we learn to forgive one another, as we learn to extend mercy and and to work through the differences um, rather than holding a grudge. Uh, This is some of the work that God is doing in us as we come together in church. Uh, Commentator Raymond Brown puts it like this. He says, the church's defects present us an opportunity for earnest prayer and careful thought and loving discussion and united action to correct the deficiencies rather than running away from them. See, in the church, we don't need to run away from our differences. We don't need to run away from the hurts. It's a ministry of reconciliation where hopefully we can bring the mercy and forgiveness of God to bear on everything. And it's hard, I get that. We come to church with baggage. We all come with baggage, with wounds. Some of our wounds are fresh, some of them are older. No doubt we'll cause new wounds with one another over the years to come. I hope not too many, but it'll happen. The real question is, what do we do with those wounds? Do we run away? Do we, do we give up on God? Or do we do the hard work of learning to forgive as the Holy Spirit works in us? How will we deal with those hurts when they arise? And the answer, I hope, is with love. And that's the second part 
of uh, the commands. Paul says, over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So that list of virtues above, um, it's only a list that works when they're done in love. As we pursue kindness and compassion and humility, they teach us to love the ones that we're serving. And they teach us to think outside of ourselves and, and to consider the other person. Uh, that's how we learn to love people who are different from ourselves, by deliberately choosing to love through the attitude that we put on. Uh, come back to Hebrews 10.24. The second part of the writer's exhortation was this. Um, let us consider how we may spur one another on to love. We've talked about that. And to good deeds. See, love and good deeds go hand in hand. Um, whatever good works we do as a church, they'll be an expression of the love that we have for others. So what kind of good deeds is uh, the writer to the Hebrews talking about? What kind of loving good deeds should we be spurring one another on towards? Well, there's no answer here in Hebrews, is there? It doesn't tell us what good deeds we should be spurring one another on towards. But when we look through the Old Testament and the New Testament, there, there are hundreds of ways uh, that are expressed, ways to show love and to care for one another. And perhaps that's why the writer starts his exhortation with this, let us consider how we may spur one another on. Let, let's think about it. Let's discuss it. Let's ponder on it. Let's pray about it. Let's think about it. It's our job as a church to discuss the best ways to love our community, to, to love one another, uh, to do good deeds that, that will uh, echo out into the highlands. And, and uh, it might be different here in Robertson and the highlands compared to my church in America or, or the church in the inner city where I used to work. What does loving one another practically look like here in Robbo? And I'm not sure of the answer, but gee, I look forward to the discussion. I look forward to the conversation. I look forward to many of you stepping up to, to volunteer as we express our love in good deeds, as we show the love of Jesus in our church and in our community. Because at the end of the day, our loving good deeds, they're not just for our own sake. They're actually an expression of God's loving good deeds in our lives. We love because we've been shown love. We love because we're being made more and more like Jesus every day. We love because that's who we are in Christ. So as we go into the week ahead and the months ahead, take a moment to consider how will you spur our church on to love and good deeds? Or will it be by stopping to pray for somebody? Will it be making a phone call to somebody you haven't seen for a while? Will it be getting a coffee with somebody? Will it be encouraging somebody with a word from Scripture? or a card, or a note in the mail, or an email, or a text? Will you compliment somebody for a godly behavior you've seen in them? Will you apologize for a wound that you've caused? How will you encourage our church? Spur them on in love and good deeds. Why don't we pray that God would help us to do that? Heavenly Father, we, we give you thanks for the picture of who you are making us in Christ. We look forward to the day when we're no longer unfinished people, but, but finished and, and completely holy. For the moment as we sin, Heavenly Father, would you grant us forgiveness as we know that the Lord has promised? Would you uh, help us to put on the new self, to put off the old self? And most of all, would you help us to put on love so that we can follow the Lord Jesus Christ in sharing love and mercy and compassion and forgiveness? And we pray, Father, that as we do this, you'd transform our community, that we'd all be spurred on towards faith and good deeds. And we pray, Father, that in your mercy, those around us in Robertson and the rest of the Highlands would see the goodness of the Lord and come to faith and salvation in Jesus. We pray in his precious name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing now about how deep the Father's love for us is.